and they called him Butuko, which means he who eats, sleeps, and shits. <laughs> and, and then he was still overseeing, you know, Nalanda was like, you know, Harvard or Yale or Oxford or something, where people came from country monasteries, and they, and then they sort of did the advanced studies, and then they went back to wherever, or he, I think he came from Orissa. <laughs> and so then one day, the teacher, the guru, his guru said to him, well, now, Shantideva, you've been here a long time. Maybe it's time you presented your dissertation and took off, you know, which was a, you know oral an oral speech to the whole community. So he said, "Okay, that's great. I'll do that." And then they all started laughing, and then everybody came because they thought it would be such a such a disgrace because he was so ignorant. They thought, but, and then when he got on the teaching thing whatever day it was appointed, he, he said, would you like to hear something you've heard before or something you never heard before? And they said, from you, Shantideva, from you, Busuku, something you ne we never heard before. And then he uttered this, bodhi this way of the Bodhisattva, you know, Bodhicharya Avatar, which is really sublime uh, poetry and deep teaching. It's really marvelous. It's one of the three great things, you know, Asanga, Nagarjuna, and Shantideva especially in its compassion teaching. And then he said, then he left after he gave the thing because he was supposed to leave. And he said, if you want the thing you heard before, that's a book under my bed, which was a book with you know, quotes you know, from different sutras and things. And uh, he said, that was the one they would have heard before. You know? So it's really, a, it's a great, great teaching. Guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, or Bodhi, way of the Bodhisattva, Bodhicharya, an introduction to the Bodhisattva career or something. Really amazing. <coughs> really amazing. It's the kind of thing you read again and again and again, and then you find new things that you didn't imagine in there. So remarkable. I can't tell if this thing is on or off. It's on. What's happening? I pushed a button that said Thank on you. off. Oh. So it's OK. OK, I'm cool. That's good to know. Seven twenty-nine. So then we set the clock back one hour. We set it back one hour. Oh, so it gets dark around six, and then but then when you set it back an hour, it'll get dark around five. That's right. I got it. I think there are a few people to come. The two Romanian doctors aren't here. I think they're collecting brownies or something. What's that? Our two Romanian doctors. Oh, yeah, they're not here yet? No. The identical twins? That's amazing. Is there anybody who would like to be in the Living Dying Project mailing list that hasn't signed it yet? OK. Uh, what is it? The Living Dying Project mailing list. Oh, oh right. Just put your name down. Yeah, the name and email. I'd like to be on it. OK. Oh, you, you go first. Yeah, you go first, Sammy. Okay, there we go. <coughs> so my notion was that we would, hmm? my, my notion for tonight was that we'd do the Heart Sutra. Okay. And then I could guide a short meditation. Okay. And uh, any number of people have come up and asked questions that seem to be of much general interest. Okay. So I thought we could have a, a question and answer period. Sure. Very good. And whatever yeah. you would like to, are you, 
do from your books or? Well, yeah, uh, we were, I was going along in this one, and there was one thing in one place in this book, I'm not going to read any further. I sort of stopped when you left, but I, there is one thing. There's one set of instructions that I want to find. Actually, I should have done that when we were talking. So does this say TBT7? That's your no, email? TBT. Oh, that's me, TBT7? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just I want to make sure I could read it, that's all. So does everybody remember yeah, that, here's the one. that tonight is the end of daylight savings time? No. <laughs> Set your clock back an hour when you go to bed, please. Or you will show up here tomorrow morning and you'll be the only person. Which is better than showing up an hour late. <laughs> Maybe. What have I done? <laughs> Calm down. It's only time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, shall we begin? Yes. Everybody's ready? Everybody got their sutra? You got a copy of the sutra, Nila? No. The sutra's right Sarita. here. Sarita has. Sarita's bringing a couple over there. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati, Pranya, Paramita, Hridaya, in Tibetan, Chomden, Dema, Chela, Pajinimo, in English, the Blessed Lady, Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagurha, together with the great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas, at that, At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching of somebody called the Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the Profound Transcendence of Wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Sharadati Putra thus, Shariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness, voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter, neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, that's all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness, there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no, conception, no, no mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to, to mentality, mentality sense, sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. 
There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance, and so on up to no old age and death, and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shariputra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom, his spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, he ultimately succeeds in nirvana, and all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcel perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth. The Transcendent Wisdom Mantra as follows Tadatta. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. Shariputra, the Shuddha Bodhisattva, the great hero, learned the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from that Samadhi and applauded the Noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it. And even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the Blessed Lord has spoken thus, the Venerable Sharadati Putra, the Noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the Great Hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoiced and all applauded what the Buddha said. Okay. <clears throat> Many of you have come with uh, questions at lunchtime during breaks, and many of the questions seem to me of general interest. So rather than answering everybody individually, I thought we would spend some time tonight at least uh, having a question and answer session. I remember you asked the question and you over there and we'll uh, do that. But first, I would like to do a guided meditation, which will go through the stages that we have talked about in my presentations in the previous sessions. So we begin, please, by examining our motivation for practice. And let the four mind-turning truths begin to be contemplated. The first of them, you will die, but you don't know when. Death is certain, the hour of death is uncertain. Life is precious. This moment is the only moment in which one can awaken. This human birth, a human birth in which we have the blessing to pursue and understand the Dharma is a great blessing, a rare blessing. There is karma, what we do think or say has an effect. And when we act, think, or speak with aversion or grasping, there is suffering. If we gather these four mind-turning truths together, can that then be the motivation that during these next few minutes of practice, we examine with great clarity and courage our experience? Beginning then by invoking from the depth of your heart that which you trust. The Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the Triple Gem, the spirit of truth, the spirit of love, the Christ, the Great Mother, Shiva, whatever name or nameless quality you ascribe to that which you most deeply trust. Invoke that then from 
the depth of your heart so that the mind can begin to relax its grasping, letting thoughts, sensations arise as they will without the need to squeeze understanding or meaning out of what is happening. Invoking in the sense of receiving, accepting that which is true, that which supports us, that which is trustworthy. Opening our hearts and our minds to this truth. And as a way then of bringing this trust also into our physical bodies, firstly taking a few grounding breaths, breathing in through the base of your torso into the earth, she who supports the earth of nourishment and grounding and support, the great mother, the infinite grounding energy. that allows us to work directly with any fear that may arise. Trusting that in this moment we are supported and what is arising is the perfect expression of this moment, the only possible expression, grounded in that truth. Letting the lower part of your body your pelvis, your legs, and your feet become, become filled with a sense of groundedness, strength, mountain-like stability. If there is resistance to dropping down so far from the mind that wants to know, notice the resistance not as a problem or a distraction, but as simply an integral part of the healing process. Coming back again to inhabiting the base, receiving she who supports. And then with this very brief introduction, moving on to centering the belly center behind the navel. As we breathe out, as we let go of breath, we let go of any identification we have with our mind and drop down into the center of our physical and energetic body. Soft belly soft shoulders, belly receiving chi, strength, prana, in infinite supply. Being centered implies that there is a stillness around which all activity occurs. In fact, your very sense of self dropping down into your belly so that instead of paying attention to your belly, you're paying attention from your center. Hearing the sound of my voice from an energetic stance of being centered. Grounded, centered, lower body, stable like a mountain. Letting 
just then be a very brief foundation for inhabiting the heart of compassion, the heart that always shines even though at times it is seemingly obscured, meeting each experience with mercy, no matter the content, as soon as you notice that you have been caught in the mind, in identification with experience, with content, come back to being awake and present with mercy. Compassion being born in this very simple moment in which you notice that you have been lost. The foundation of being centered, supporting the open heart, the heart of compassion making bearable, workable, whatever may arise no matter what the content. As we inhabit our belly center. And as the heart becomes more and more skylike in its appearance, more spacious, more empty of the notion of separateness, the sense of warmth and connectedness, the true nature of a skylike heart reveals that that which we invoke is actually not something that in any way we are separate from. that the nature of that which you invoke, that which is most trustworthy, is your own true nature. And as we rest in this wisdom, the content of experience becomes much less a focus than our relationship with the quality of experience. The blissful, radiant nature arising in each moment regardless of the content of experience. A distracted mind, a focused mind, a pleasant sensation, an unpleasant sensation, nothing ever lacking, nothing in excess. Vast, boundless heart, Letting go of all effort except the effort to die into each moment, surrendering into the wisdom mind, the heart of compassion, an energetic body that is centered and grounded. Nothing to achieve, nothing to understand. you were to take your last breath with this openness of heart, this clarity of mind, how would that be different from dying with fear or confusion?
consciousness, pure awareness, meeting each experience. Dedicating the merit of our practice with the wish that all beings might realize the intrinsic freedom of their minds and be free from suffering. And even though a bell will ring, it does not mean to stop resting in the wisdom mind, in the heart of compassion, in an energetic body that is grounded and centered as a foundation, a stable foundation. Going back to our motivation, what is the most important thing? My first meditation teacher, Suzuki Roshi, said, the most important thing is finding the most important thing. What is the most important thing for you? Can we keep this in our heart as we explore together here tonight? It's often said that the post-meditation period is equally, if not more important than the meditation period itself. Can we integrate those feelings of clarity and spaciousness, open-heartedness into activity, into communication, rather than there being a discontinuity between what we call meditation and what we call after meditation. Several of the questions that I was asked had to do with what kind of support to give to people who are dying. Mm -hmm. And let me just briefly, without any question, let me just mention one thing. And that there are really two levels of support. The relative level, doing the ah breath, doing Tong Len practice, helping people be grounded and centered, working with mantra, doing different things like that. Having a toolkit breeds confidence. It helps you feel that you can help someone. Your confidence helps them. But the, the, the greatest gift you can bring to the bedside of someone who is dying or to someone who is living is Resting in open mind, wisdom mind, nature of mind. So then it doesn't really matter too much what you do or say. It will come out of a place of great wisdom. Whereas if we're there trying to do the right thing, from a dualistic place, what message is that bringing to the person who's dying? They are inexorably being drawn into a place beyond duality and you are there trying to help them from a place of duality. So that can be, it can be useful. Certainly it's better than being surrounded by people who are busy saying, oh, you're gonna be okay, nothing to worry about, or <laughs> other people who are tearing their hair out because they're so emotionally enmeshed. But the greatest gift you can bring is to be resting in that spaciousness that I hope most of us were able to just briefly rest in during that practice we were doing a few minutes ago. And then the person who is dying, who is often very psychic, is often very sensitive to pick up what is going on in the room, will realize here is somebody who's open, that, that they are feeling that this, this moment of my dying is a workable moment. Maybe it's workable for me too. Maybe I don't have to 
worry about what's going to happen next. Maybe I can open into this with confidence because this person seems to be able to do that. Okay, so now open into questions. And they can be for me, they can be for Robert, they can be for both of us, whatever, whatever you'd like. Sally. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm worried. I should go back to my wisdom mind right away. <laughs> Yes. And uh, I didn't understand what that meant, even though I knew what it was about and how I was wanting to know a little bit. Yeah. And um, I asked him what he meant, and he said, your mother has a little more, and if you can tell me what that means, she has a heart valve called Sagan that's hard to recover at all, and we've been over to her, but that took us could die tonight, she could die tomorrow, she could die in a week, it could be a month, and she dies of starvation because her instructions are that you not eat food in the food. Mm -hmm. um, so I am making a medical recommendation to administer a high level of morphine. Right. And so I said, okay, I, let me call my local dealer, and I did, and I asked him to call her, I said, you know, my that it was personal and then he said yes so then I called the doctor back and I said all right I understand my brother and I agree on this and he said well you have to do I had to, he said you have to take her out she's in a Catholic hospital so they won't I can prescribe it but because she's in a Catholic hospital they won't uh, give her morphine if they use a standstill injection of morphine how much it took a lot of work it's like 24 hours of over two minute over so the doctor from Lincoln Home is in the hospital. He's going to take over. That's all I knew. And I was in the room. She was in a coma. And um, a phone call came to me in the hall saying, make that call. And it was a hospice worker who um, we have a, a prescription from your mother's doctor. And we refuse to honor it. We are going to refuse to administer this morphine, and um, I went ballistic. Like, I, it took a lot of emotion for me to just do all of this, and I started yelling at this hospice worker, you know, you do what the doctor orders, I'm taking his recommendation, my brother and I have agreed to take his recommendation, whatever he prescribes, and my mother hung up at my end just yelling, and um, the she finally said, all right, you know, we have this person. Can I interrupt for just a second? So as we're hearing this story, yelling and the morphine and the doctor, is this pulling you out of being present, being in your body, being in your heart, your relationship with the story? Can you be hearing all that and stay really present? Please continue. And um, I found myself doing it, and it was like, no, you know, nothing I'd ever experienced, but I'd never experienced any other way. But, uh, you know, I just needed, it took a lot of emotional work, and my brother and I had talked about this, and the doctor said he was strongly suggesting this. And so that took me by surprise, and I'd never really process that, but what happened next was um, they agreed to it, and the charge nurse down the hall heard me yelling. She had not been a kind person during the weeks that my mother was gone, but she walked up to me in the room, and she just nodded her head like this, like she had heard this before, and that it was all right, and she knew what was taking place, and 
I wasn't really sure what I would do, but I just, the doctor was just off to the right and I was just there. So I left mm -hmm. at the end of the day and the, the morphine was administered and um, I phoned my uncle and we got the phone call at around six in the morning that my mother had died at 5 a.m. Okay. And um, so... So what is the question? Well, at the time, I didn't know that there was a thing called pain restoration, which I learned five years later in a bioethics seminar <coughs> that I was in. Mm -hmm. And they were discussing euthanasia, and I studied quinine. And the professor asked me during the day, you know, your quinine nurse is to die. And I said, um, I killed my mother, which was just kind of a gut feeling I had when we were discussing it, that perhaps I ought not to have agreed with the doctor that I had no idea what I had done mm -hmm. necessarily. I didn't know the phrase pain restoration or how common it was or if it was common at all. And um, was concerned that I had heard people go on there for several weeks and it's bad for them. I just didn't know what to do. So I spoke with the professor. He was a bioethicist and he asked me to be really good in the class and to write this, you know, to write during the class just explaining to me my class experience so I could hear from him. And one of them said, you know, this is called pain restoration. It's actually not called euthanasia. And um, I have had a concern, that was like five years ago, he died 10 years ago. And when Bob was talking about quinine, um, I had some really serious questions um, about how, how my participation in this you know, may have generated from that and that maybe I should not have, I mean I can't undo it it was done <coughs> I heard of it okay. and so can you maybe go speak to that you, speak to, you, know, you, you don't have the karma of killing your mother, absolutely not karma depends on motivation right and also there's a, there are four things it depends on and one of them also is identification of the target of the act and you did not intend to kill your mother. The guy said sedation and out of pain. That's what you thought was it was. You only heard the other thing five years later. <laughs> so you had no intention to do in your mother. You knew she was going, and you thought it was he, he was doing it to make her more comfortable. Right. So A, you didn't identify someone as that person. I'm <coughs> going to kill that person. So therefore, And then two, your motivation was for your mother's comfort. So three, do, you had nothing to do with killing her. So you can be cool, relax. Hi. Right, that's what <laughs> I was going to say too. I gave the example a couple days ago that there's a mugger who puts a knife in your stomach and you die and a surgeon puts a scalpel in your stomach you die. They have two very different motivations, two very different karmas. They both did the same thing. Although Bob today was really, you know. Just You're talking about Yeshi Dandan today. Someone a lot, you know, he was well that's just the baseline. But you were not being told that, you know, you might as well, your mother might live a month, she might live a week, she might live a day, so we're going to do her in quick. Oh, well, great, you, oh, let's do that. No, you didn't, that wasn't the, the conversation. It was morphine means sedation, means painlessness, yeah. means getting stoned without anesthesia, it means. So that's what you thought you were agreeing to. So, so just forget about it. The motivation for, from your, for your action was altruistic. Yeah. He did indicate that it Not only that, there was no intention to do her in, so therefore there is no karma of killing. Okay? Zero. Is that clear? Zero. That should be clear. Not a zilch. Zilch. <laughs> End of story. End of story. Next question. Next question. <laughs> Eva. <coughs> Eva. It's a related question. Okay. <coughs> Being sedated in what? During the dying process. What is our opinion of being sedated well, during the... You know more about that. Right. I, all I know is during the birth process, I wanted to be sedated. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but but, okay. but uh, about the dying, I don't know. It depends on how Okay, so once again, we're talking about karma here. <coughs> if I had my hip replaced and I, wa I, I wanted to be awake, 
I mean, certainly I had a block, so I wasn't feeling a lot of pain, but I, f I figured this is going to be interesting. You know, a light construction zone, bone dust flying around, and <laughs> cauterizing flesh and things like that, <laughs> that this would be an I interesting thing to be <laughs> there for. What was this operation? Hip replacement. Oh, my God. Did I have a beer? A beer. <laughs> they actually had a curtain up so you couldn't see. But, the, but the, the, the point to your question is if you can be present without resistance, why not be present? If, however, the pain is such that you can't deal with it and you are resisting and contracting and creating the karma of, oh, I can't take this, Take some drugs. Nothing wrong with taking some drugs. Uh, at the same time, as we talked about right before lunch today, uh, we talked about the pain meditation. And that many people, myself certainly included, learn a lot about not automatically reacting to the unpleasant through my relationship with physically unpleasant sensations, mm -hmm. which is much easier and more direct than trying to deal with unpleasant emotions or thoughts because they're much more seductive and confusing. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a whole spectrum here of how severe the pain is. And I would encourage everyone to explore the possibility of being with unpleasant sensation and seeing if you can relax, if you can soften, if you can have an open heart. It's just an unpleasant sensation. When you're dying, it might be really super unpleasant. We don't know. And if every time something unpleasant arises, you go, I can't deal with this, you are setting yourself up for potential trouble. Okay, uh, at the same time, if, if the pain is so severe, like in childbirth or whatever it might happen to be, then uh, of course, take the sedation so that you can be present as much as mm -hmm. possible as the, 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 the uh, analgesic will allow. Uh, let me give you just two examples. When, when Stan Groff was uh, first here in America, the National Institutes of Health funded him to do an, an experiment where they were giving a low dose of LSD to terminal, can to terminal cancer patients, quote unquote, as a psychotherapeutic way of dealing with fear of pain. 100 micrograms LSD hospital setting. And they found that this was very successful until the government decided they didn't want right. to be in the job of pushing psychedelics. <laughs> so they cut the experiment. But what they found that really surprised them was because to be in the experiment, you had to have quote unquote terminal cancer, it meant that a lot of these people had a lot of pain. This was back in the dark ages when hospice wasn't as good as titrating pain medication. And what they found that surprised them was that many of these people after their psychedelic sessions experienced a significant reduction in the need for pain medication, yet LSD has absolutely no pain relieving properties. Aha, what is that about? Well, if I think that I'm five feet, eight inches tall and I weigh 170 pounds and there's X amount of pain bouncing around inside of me, that can be a really big problem. If I have an, exper an experience that leads me to believe I'm the whole universe, that same amount of pain can be bouncing around. What's the big deal? <laughs> I'm the whole universe, <clears throat> right? Right. So how big are you? Who are you? Who's, I mean, Stephen Levine says, who dies? Well, who experiences the pain? They've done other experiments where people who were taking massive amounts of morphine for uh, pain relief were instead given a small amount of morphine in conjunction with a small amount of an antidepressant and a small amount of a muscle relaxant. And it was found that many of these patients could do just as well and not be heavily sedated. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, the antidepressant and the muscle relaxant are a chemical equivalent sort of of the pain meditation. It's helping you relax, to be spacious, to not be resistant. And then the person didn't need this massive amount of mm -hmm. opiates. They just needed a little bit.
One final have story. Add a little acid on top of that, and they probably would have been recovered. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> a little acid. Add a little acid yeah, on there top you of it. They, they would have <laughs> levitated. <laughs> so when I just one final little story. When when I had my hip replaced, uh, there was a half hour period where the the uh, operative analgesic wore off, and the post operative a, uh, a anesthetic had not taken effect. So for half an hour the largest muscle of my body, my butt muscle, had been cut through, and I was in the most intense pain I could imagine. And I was in ecstasy. There was no possibility of being distracted or thinking about it. It was just me making love with the sensations. It was just like there was nothing but this red-hot pain going on. <laughs> I did have I did have the big advantage that I knew it was going to be done really soon. Oh, that's uh... <laughs> I got to talk to you <laughs> later. Okay, somebody had their hand up over here, Susan. And then. Yes. So, did you hear? I do. Doesn't, doesn't uh, large amounts of anesthesia numb out the consciousness you want to have as you're dying? Well, it depends, I think. I think that, uh, yeah, large amounts. But after all, when you die, you become also, and it, you become analgesic. You don't feel your body anymore. That's part of the process. So accelerating that a little bit, I think, in, uh, I mean, you, uh, 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 Dale already said, if you can manage a little pain and it's kind of nudging you along, and you're mainly focused on keeping an open mind, then it's you don't need much more, or you don't need anything. But if your pain is really distracting you from what's happening and you're only freaking out about, then you're just accelerating the natural leaving the body. I think it's perfectly okay, actually. I think that you know the the medical people are so nervous about you know some kind of drugs, but at least they can't think that the person in, who is dying is going to become addicted, <laughs> end up end up on the Bowery or something. You know, they're going to end up in the cemetery in any case. So I think it's not it's not too drastic a problem. I don't think so. There is a kind of a related issue that I have seen several times hospices because of the fear of death of the hospice staff yeah, that's possible. overly medicating yeah, that's patients out of all consciousness. It's completely overloading them with uh, very strong drugs, just assuming that who would want to be around for dying uh, in a way that was really quite unnecessary. And I called attention to that in a few cases. They called up the hospice. Hospice actually apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't really know what we were doing. Right. And, then they, and then the person was able to kind of be reconscious again, if you will, and had a wonderful final few days with their family. So yeah. hospice might make an assumption that isn't necessarily the way you want things to go. So you, you should be very clear about what your values are, having these advanced directives, having conversations with relatives and physicians and things. Mm -hmm. Steve was going to ask. I had, asked, I had asked you earlier about our friend. Penny. The famous Penny. The famous Penny. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, I don't know what to say to him. You know, I mean, uh, we're going to go back to California. And we're going to tell him where we've been and what we've been doing and how much we've enjoyed it and uh, how rich and interesting it was. But I'm not going to know what to say to her particularly when she's inquiring of us or informing us, well, they tell me I have this, I have it there, I have it here, I have it there. And, um, well, how long do you have to live? Well, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. Then we have our own ideas. Well, right. is she going to wait another couple of months or even <coughs> a month or a year or two years? <coughs> she has a very strong mind and a strong will. And right. I think she's 
trying to decide that what to elect for himself and okay. to get least I, I think I think she got the name I think you got the name I'm I'm not sure. I listened to her with an open mind mm -hmm. for one thing because I just got a, a you know a sharp say that she's not gonna do anything and she feels very good about that. She's not taking any seats. No 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 seats. She's and she feels good about that. That's her decision. Okay. The Michael Newton book will be very helpful. Yeah. I think, but though, that there's something to do beyond just letting her do what she wants to do, which is letting her know that you are available to talk about anything if she wants to, yeah. without saying, without in any way implying I will, will draw any kind of love if you decide not to. So that the message is, it's up to you. You're setting, you're setting the boundaries here about what it is that we, we can talk about. And if you make the boundary really small, in no way will I pull back from you. But I'm here to talk about anything that you might want to talk about. Yeah. The, the other thing I think that's important is you yourselves read those books. Yes. And then they're in, it's in your mind. Yes. And you'll become engaged with that. You know? And I think you should look at the Book of the Dead. You should look at Michael Newton. You should, uh, and, and then you uh, read Stephen Levine's thing, the one, the second one, not who dies, but the other one that you said. Healing into life. And, and then death. when you're, f you, this is in your presence, you know, these ideas and these feelings are in the presence, which you will go through when you read them. Then you will be in this presence that she might then ask you something or talk to you, say, you know, I've been reading these interesting books and here they are. And I really was engaged in this and the other. And it's like you know, sharing a novel that someone read with you, sharing so different stories, different perspectives. And you're sort of confident in those perspectives. And then that's, that's a big thing for the people, you know, I think. You know? yeah. It's not a matter of reading it to them right off. It's yourself having it in your mind. And then they, they might want you to share with them something. Another thing that I like is there are some, there are, you know, mm, da, you know, like Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, mm -hmm. uh, some Sufi things, Rumi, reading beautiful things that have beautiful imagery in them, I think is also very good. There are some things called known as the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra, but it's a little heavy for someone who doesn't know. But these amazing visions of sort of beautiful heavenly spaces, the Indian imagination is incredibly rich with them, and um, people just just great beautiful imagery, you know, like beautiful places, you know, fields of flowers, you know, like things woven in like tapestry streaming from heaven, you know, with extraordinary embroidery sort of thing. Just things that get the imagination into bright and, and brilliant and pleasant sensations and colors and things like that, I think is very pleasant for people. And I think the idea that there might be really wonderful places to go and there are really beautiful perspectives on reality, I think is very helpful to people, that's all. It doesn't have to be some Buddhist thing, it's just different world systems. Our Western Imagination in our spiritual writings is very slight, actually. There's not much. If you think of the, the different Bibles, how many descriptions of heavenly halls are there? Very little. You know, Isaiah sees some wheels turning, some guy in a fiery chariot. Or, but the actual, you know, the throne rooms of, the, of, divi of divinities and things, there's very little description. Whereas India, Indian literature has huge descriptions. Pure land of Krishna dancing around with gopis, and I don't know, it's really quite. So lavish, amazing. So it's worth helping people by reading some other, something from some other culture, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you have it in your own imagination, this kind right. of, or cheery vision. It's very helpful. You said one thing when I was in Africa talk, talking about the book. You said something you prayed was you would love again. Did you say Grief dares one to love again. Robert. Rick. Rick. Yeah. Oh, Rick. Yeah. Um, actually, one quick comment on the tradition. Um, for the short time I've been working with Bob, uh, the tradition of Hunt, um, I've figured out that I have to ask the clients early on how committed they want to be. The, the first few clients I have, I never have another word with them. They pass the time. It's all very hard. Yeah, 
He said that he's been working with, with dying clients and he's learned that he has to have a conversation with somebody about how sedated they want to be right in the very beginning because if you wait too long, hospice has sedated people out of ability to communicate with him any longer. Oh. I'm sorry, how common is it? How common is it when you have um, dying who are seeking forgiveness from you as a counselor? For you to forgive them? Well, people who don't have phrases, who aren't open to phrases, but want to have a conversation about things that they want to be forgiven for. So I, what I've done is I've handed it in general terms. Um, but it's, I'm wondering, because I've had that happen twice. Is that a common thing? Well, I have to confess that I work with a very strongly uh, self-selected subpopulation of dying people who want spiritual support, which is probably not the people that go to hospice in Cincinnati, Ohio. Nope. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I don't, re I don't recall it ever happening uh, in my experience. Uh, certainly, there are graduated levels of ways you can support somebody who's dying. The, 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 the best way is to help somebody do what the Tibetan Buddha or the dead is talking about, to find the luminosity, uh, the wisdom mind. Uh, if they can't do that, can somebody do compassion practice? Can they... Uh, kind of forgive themselves, have compassion for all the things that haven't worked out in their lives. If they can't do that, uh, can you have somebody uh, just remember the good things they've done in life? Everybody's done something good. Hitler did something good. He loved his mommy or who knows what. That, so that you're dying at least with a positive thought in your mind. Uh, and uh, there's even another one that there may be where you have somebody dedicate their suffering so that other people may be free of suffering. So that even though they're, they're dying and they're, they're still suffering, instead of saying, oh, this is terrible, I'm suffering, I'm offering the suffering so that other people don't suffer so much. And uh, that can really comfort someone's heart. Because fundamentally, everybody is forgiven. Well, and that's, in one case, that's what I spoke about my feelings about forgiveness. Yeah. Which felt appropriate, and then I second guessed myself and wondered if that was not appropriate. But that's why I'm asking. There, sure. is a, there is a very direct forgiveness meditation, where supposing your patient's name is Joe, mm -hmm. and you just get Joe to start saying, Joe, I forgive you. Joe, I forgive you. And in the beginning, he concentrates on the words, and then you encourage him to imagine what that would feel like if he actually experienced that. And to really go into the feeling of what it would be like to be forgiven. And for many people, it takes many months to go through this. But if somebody's looking at death uh, around the immediate corner, they can do these practices much more directly and quickly than somebody who thinks they've got tomorrow and the next day and the next day to do these things. So there's three kinds of forgiveness. There's forgiving yourself, there's asking forgiveness, and there's offering forgiveness to people that you feel that you may have harmed. And they're very traditional. I think Sharon Salzberg has a book of loving kindness and forgiveness meditations that are okay. very, very useful. I think one big thing to ask someone who's like that is I'll ask them about if there's anybody that they themselves do not forgive, who they feel have harmed or betrayed or harmed them, and, and get them to work on that. Because it's very bad for them to die with a grudge. That's a really bad thing. So, so the idea of like, if they give up their grudge, then 
then, then anybody who might have a grudge against them will be, will be more inclined, I mean, on some sort of, you know, psychic level to, to forgive them, and they're more likely to feel they deserve forgiveness because they forgave somebody, and they'll feel more comfortable, I think. If, they, if someone's really concerned about forgiveness, they might be, have been having a long and bitter fight with a family member or a sibling or a partner or an ex-partner or something. And that's intense. I love that in connection with the future life thing with people, especially in America, about how people shouldn't drive too hard a bargain with their exes because <laughs> they're going to fall in love with them next life and then they might be, a shoe might be on the other foot. <laughs> I don't think there's people... People are like, oh. Sally, yeah. your mouth is wide open. What? <laughs> when you were saying about forgiving your ex, her mouth was hanging wide open. Yeah, no, I was just thinking. Like, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, th there's a, it's like a forgiveness website. There are people who write oh, right. in where they say they're, they ask forgiveness. Oh, that's good. Okay, um, you can find this on there. If you Google you know, There's also a thing in Mill Valley. There's a forgiveness society. And they give forgiveness awards every year. <laughs> and then they wanted to give me one. They gave Marianne Williamson one, other people. And then, and then I couldn't go there. First I said, well, that would be very nice. I, you know, I'd like to have that. And then I'll try. I like Mill Valley. I'd like to go. And then only, a, unfortunately, too soon near the event, around six weeks before I realized I couldn't really go. So I said, I'm sorry, I can't come. And they Please didn't forgive, forgive me. You. And they didn't forgive me. If they're not specifying that they want to confess to the priest or they don't want absolution, this website you could offer to, they could tell you what they want you to do. And say, I ask forgiveness for what I did to my best friend when I was 10 and I was going to be shot down when I was 11 or whatever. And, and if you look at that website, you can read hundreds of people, you know, what their, you know, they need a forgiveness. That sounds really good. We have a question over here. Yes. Oh, Robert, you're Robert. Yeah. Uh, I was visiting with my brother uh, like the day before he died. He was riddled with cancer, uh, prostate cancer, mm. and he was uh, for a turn in his life. He had taken uh, her picture and flattened it down on his table, and he was making a movement with his only arm that he could use, like he was trying to pray. I waited for like 15 minutes for him to go through this process, and then I tried to do this. You were talking earlier about the deep being on a strength, and I tried to draw him out of that anger and stuff here into going back into his life and finding the moments that were when he was fully present. Now you could be throwing a six-year dog in the park with your kid, working on some kind of sculpture or something, but where you're just like totally there. And it's just like the thing in real life is made up of like jewelry or necklace of these right. moments. And it just like drew him right out of that and worked it from there. <laughs> Good, great. Yeah. Is fainting clear light? What's that? Is fainting clear light? Fainting? Yeah. What about that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if you, if you recognize it, any kind of loss of consciousness, you go through those stages. Okay. They say, actually, yawning is opening the central channel, a certain type of yawn, and you draw energy from those deeper places. 
That's where the yawn is, actually. And uh, they say, you know, and fainting and all this kind of thing. But every night when we sleep, that's the big thing to work on. I've got a very provocative fainting story. When I was first meeting Ramdas, uh, there was a party at this guy Joel's house that we were talking about across the street. Yeah. And he had just given a big talk at Stanford, and there's all these people, and it was really hot. And I had been slightly sick. I had a fever. And I was talking to Ramdas and a minister and a psychiatrist. The four of us were standing. It's like, <laughs> like a build up to a perfect joke, right? OK. And we were talking about something. I said, I've got the perfect book. Let me run across the street to my house and get this book. And I ran barefoot in the cold rain. And I came back into the hot house. And I fainted right there with Ramdas, the psychiatrist, and the minister. And I fainted right at their feet. But the interesting part of it was, as I came back, the first thing that happened was I experienced consciousness. And then I experienced uh, I'm Dale. And then I'm, I'm, I'm Dale. Oh, yeah, OK. And then I'm Dale who fainted. And then I'm Dale who maybe should be embarrassed that he fainted in front of Rambas, the minister, <laughs> and, the, and the psychiatrist, right? But it, it was clear that those levels of identity were completely gone, and they just started coming back one at a time. <laughs> and was he Richard at that time? He was no, he was, he was Rambas. It was just oh, barely really? Rambas, the beginning of Rambas. And <laughs> all three of them were like looking down at me with great concern. It was, it was a pretty funny moment. <laughs> that was very funny. Oh, at Amherst Johnson Chapel? And it's on the section where no air conditioning is, and I fainted. And you had a big... You fainted? Yeah. It was at North, a team from North Vietnam, and a few subs for Father Chicken. <laughs> and, um, and you said, I was touched by God. But I remember, like, you, Dale, I, I woke up and I went, no. And my brothers are laughing, you know, and, and then my father comes up with snow and salt, and uh, no, Joe's mother, and my father's sitting in the room, and I'm like, I can't believe it. You sure it wasn't because Joe told you that Nina predicted that you, you would have five children? <laughs> I might have caused me to faint. Well, there's nobody there even to forget if we're a part of the time, of course. But it was all nice. Oh, that's great. Another question. Oh, yeah, William. Yeah, I am um, in a situa situation with my cousin. I'm in a situation with my cousin who is, um, has been uh, schizophrenic for most of his life. Do you want to stand up and come a little closer so Bob can hear what you're saying? I'm sorry, yes? Your schizophrenic cousin, yes, what about him? Uh, he's, he, was, he was schizophrenic for most of his life. Uh -huh. He's been living in a home for the disabled um, out in the Rockaways for the last uh -huh. 10, 15 years. Yes. barely brought him back from the ICU at the hospital to a massive um, antibiotic. Uh -huh. And you often lose um, faculties, unpredictable what you lose at, after you recover from something. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, to what effort you get him back. Um, so I, I'm the only one who's, who's responsible. Uh -huh. As far as like uh, giving them, um, uh, authorizing a do, a do not resuscitate, do not 
the first few days of February until he starts the last week in January. He, at the moment, he's um, uh, he can't breathe because of his circulatory. His oh yeah. He can't talk. And um, have you had any conversation with him before this happened about his wishes at the end of his life? So, so are you wondering whether to give a do not resuscitate order yeah, or not to, or what the so karma the is? The moral dilemma is where, at what point do I say don't resuscitate him? They suggested that I sign a do not resuscitate order in case he needs CPR, which can be like yeah. I think you should do that. Yeah. I think, well, don't they say 95% of doctors themselves say don't resuscitate me? Yeah. Because when you do, then you get them. They almost always are very damaged, and it's really Correct. terrible, painful. Yeah, yeah. And there's a st you know that story about why they they lost the Indian surgical traditions in Tibet, because one king's wife in the imperial time in Tibet before the ninth century, uh, probably eighth century or something, one one queen had some sort of heart thing, and they did heart surgery, according to some kind of op their own version of open heart. They did something to her. I don't know. I don't remember the exact thing, but some deep kind of surgery like that in the central nervous system, at the heart area. And then she did live. She survived a bit longer, whatever the stroke or attack that she had or whatever it was. And then the king, in a dream, then she did die after about a year. And then in a dream, she came to her husband or son. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not better on the detail. Uh, but one of the responsible people, and she said, you know, that surgery that I did the previous year gave me a lot of trouble extricating my consciousness from my body, and I had a much more unpleasant time dying than had it, which I now know, than I would have had if you'd let me go at that first time and not done the surgery. So then that's a, it's a, it became a precedent in Tibet where they then purposely, you know, the, they had extraordinary surgical tools. Actually, some Scotch guy who went to Tibet in the 18th century created a whole dynasty tool, a surgical tool business in Glasgow based on Tibetan tools that he found that were much better than the ones in Europe. <laughs> you know, am amazing, the steel work and whatever, the shapes of them. And so they had really sophisticated tools from ancient time in India, but they didn't use them because that queen told her her relative, after she had died in a dream, she told him, don't do that. It's really better just to go clean and uh, not it sort of patch up sort of, and then you're kind of, you're working your way through the yak. In, in that case, it might have been yak gut stitches or God knows what that they were using. So, uh, you know, I don't think you should feel bad about do not resuscitate because if it was a doctor, they wouldn't want to be resuscitated. And it just makes the death, the death extrication that much more horrendous for the, for the person. And like going back to Sally's question, it's not bad karma if you're making a choice thinking I'm doing the best thing because I love my brother. Uh, uh, so it's not like you have to feel guilty. You're, you're trying to do the best thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm a great believer in asking people. And certainly a lot of people will be re responding from fear. Uh -huh. so that maybe they won't be giving a very good answer. But even there is uh, Arnie Mindell. Do you know Arnie Mindell up in Portland? Who's a, a, I don't know if he's a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but he claims that he can communicate with anybody, even in a deep coma, that as long as there is consciousness, there is the possibility of communication. Oh, really? Oh, good. Okay. And uh, I can, if, let me even briefly describe what he says. So mm -hmm. he comes in to see somebody who's in a coma and he, he tunes into their breathing pattern and he puts his hand on their forearm and each time they breathe in on the active part of the breath he squeezes their forearm for a while so that the person is getting the somatic message that somebody's there tuning into them. And then he starts talking to them only on the squeeze, only on the in-breath. Hi, my name's Arnie. I was brought here because they told me you're in a coma and 
they don't know what to do. And he, he, he says that everybody he's worked with has been able to set up some kind of signal. So he says, uh, can you uh, make some kind of signal for yes? Can you move an eyelash just a tiny bit? Can you flush your cheek or something like that? And mm -hmm. he said in every case, even people that the doctors say are in a persistent vegetative state have been able to wow. create some kind of response. Hmm. And he told me the following story. I, I don't know if it's true. I, there's no reason why he would have lied. But he said that he was called to the bedside of a young boy, maybe six, seven, eight years old. I don't know how old. And the boy had uh, brain cancer. And the brain cancer was so widespread that the doctor said something only, anyway, the, the, the doctor said that his brain scan looked like vegetable soup. And the boy hadn't spoken for a long time. The parents were completely distraught. So they called in Arnie to the situation. The mother was on one side of the bed, the father on the other side. Arnie started doing his thing. Hi, I'm Arnie. Your parents brought me here, da, 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 da. He said, uh, can, you, can you make any sign? And the boy was able to flush his right cheek. I see. So Arnie right, said. Right, puff it out. No. Uh, Put some color into it a oh, little really? bit. Yeah. So, so Arnie said, uh, do you have uh, this, this cancer because uh, of anything that happened at school? No. Is it anything that happened here or there with your siblings? No. Uh, is it anything that happened uh, having to do with God? His cheek flushed. Having to do with God? God. Uh, or religion or something like that. And the father yelled across the bed at the mother, See, I told you we shouldn't have been insisting that he go to Catholic school and become a priest. He didn't want to be. He didn't want to go to Catholic school, and it's just you making him do that, and that's why he's so sick. Oh, no. And and the parents started arguing over the over the bed. And Arnie said, "Is the fact your parents were so uh, conflicted about this? Is that part of why you're sick?" And both of his cheeks turned <laughs> red. And Arnie said, "I did this ten years ago." And he's in college now. What? And the doctor said there is no way anybody with that brain scan could have survived. They must have mixed up the pictures. Well, they always do that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. So, so you mean what happened? Then he started becoming active. Then when the, then, then, he, after, then Arnie told the parents to shut up. Yeah. And then he started <laughs> cooling down the guy. And then yeah. his, uh, his then he, got, he got the chicken soup out of his head. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> That's really vegetable something. soup. <laughs> what? Vegetable oh, soup. Oh, vegetable soup. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I told it today. When you weren't here, actually. I did tell that story this morning. What? You, you, you flushed your cheeks and your parents made them? <laughs> no, I, I, I told how I helped both of my parents die. Oh, you helped them both die? Oh, my. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Give me the punchline of the story I'm supposed to tell. What is what is going on here? Yeah. That, um, <coughs> it was about how um, these guys were in this nice religious world. I can't remember if it was a nun or a mother, but you know, that that kind of thing would be other than that. I told that story today. Everybody else has heard it. You almost remember it. So, so everybody okay. knows the story, but partly you and completely Robert. That's okay. So we'll go That's on. That's all right. I'm yes. just thinking about William. William, don't feel guilty. William, don't feel guilty if you. I think it's really good to do that. Well, there was, there was just a little more to that story. Okay. More to the story? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, well, how does the schizophrenia manifest? I'm curious. How did it manifest? Well, no, but what does it? How, what does he do that makes people say schizophrenia? He had a what? A what? Total breakdown Total in his twenties. A breakdown. When he was in his twenties, and was like just uh, not able to take care of himself. Mm -hmm. or, uh, I see. Deal with his life. He was just I see. Total meltdowns and uh, mm -hmm. very dependent on the state, totally on Medicaid, etc. Oh right, right. So, but that I mean, the point is now that um, my my daughter, who is a doctor, who feels feels like. Bad that they ha they revived him that he was that he actually it would have been better for him if he had just gone on out because now he's in this kind.
kind of purgatory state where he's yeah. not able to do anything but totally dependent. But he can't get, he doesn't go to the bathroom by himself, he doesn't do anything, just lying there in bed. Uh huh. Yeah. Be so damaging and traumatic it was just better. At the same time, if uh, if he's off the resuscitator, if they take him off the resuscitator now, uh, by which he's able to breathe, and then it turns out that he's not able to continue breathing and he and he needs to be intubated again. My daughter is urging me to sign the do not resuscitate or the do not intubate. Do not take the yeah. that's necessary to get him breathing. It's at that place that it's, I feel like it's kind of a moral dilemma because as you were saying today, any, somebody can be lying there in a, in a comatose and yet be That's true. That was easy to understand. Does that make sense? Yeah. That was easy to understand saying that's the baseline, and you're obviously acutely aware of that baseline. But then I said he did say that there are practical considerations of cost and cost not only to the family but the society and et cetera. And it may be, and that doesn't mean that uh, the, a person's development, uh, mental development, or whatever it is, angels they're wrestling with, or whatever it is, wouldn't continue after they're out of the body. So it isn't that you're you're you it isn't that you're not allowing all these kind of integrations or whatever it is to happen. Just because Finally. you turn off the just because you turn off the thank you. <laughs> just because you turn off the thing. And I think you might be feeling a little nervous about it, be feeling guilty because he happens to be in a hospital in Far Rockaway and you have to take a very, very long subway ride. So you must you should move him to Riverdale first to a hospital there, so there won't be any trace of your feeling guilty that you have to go there again and again if you don't if you do resuscitate. I also think you have to remember that it was his own belief in the past fifty years that all these patients have gone on about being able to keep people alive like a hundred years ago. You know, this was not yeah, terrible. That's true. And And it's totally insane, actually. And your daughter is like, daughter's, daughter's hipper than you are, face it. <laughs> what? It has bells. Here's another doctor wants to say something. Yes, I have to Paul. come over there oh, <laughs> to hear you. I guess I'll have to apologize. The, the story that Dale told, uh, yeah. that, uh, requires a confession about the thing that was last night earlier. Yes. What I find <laughs> difficult with this is that, um, every time somebody comes to the hospital, whether it's a 30 year old woman who's having an overdose nurse, everybody has to have been asked about her being on that. It's ridiculous to ask somebody who's 16 or 17 or 30, do you want to be resuscitated? Absolutely. They should I see. ask that. On the other hand, somebody like his cousin or, some, or a cancer patient may want to be taken care of. But there's, but there's a continuum and a clock, a clock that at some point that changes who wants to let it go. You cannot have something else. I want to be resuscitated or I do not want to be resuscitated from beginning to the end. Uh huh. Right. That's I think I think that he's, he's having actually the fact that it's hard to take care of with somebody dying. And some people do recover and with less, and some symptoms are less symptoms with weight. But the fact that he is now unable to breathe on his own, unable to function at a serious status, absolutely at that age is correct. It's yeah. Right. right. We agree. Uh, I think uh, that he, it, he should commute, he should communicate
agree, but I don't think that that would, that's an argument I could use with him. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Why do you well, say that? Well, I don't why do see you why that? you think that. You're being sentimental, I think. If he really wanted to, then he'd breathe without the tube. If he, you know, he, he, you know, you, he might be having a tremendous relief to get out of his body. The whole thing comes from the consensual reality of our culture, as I've been saying many times in the last few days, and I'm constantly harping on day and night, which is that people think that what a person is is just their body and brain of this life. And, the, and, once that, and then the, they're totally finished and gone. Therefore, hang on to it as long as possible. And that's actually stupid. It's like backward. That's not, that's not what people are. The body is a really wonderful, useful vehicle. And if it's not functioning, then get another one. And try not to get so hung up about it, I think. And in that case, the guy's been a wreck for how long? And, uh, you know, he needs to get, well, why did he fall apart anyway originally? His parents died. Where are the parents? Well, his, his mother was, uh, was schizophrenic also, was obviously. His mother was what? His schizophrenic. Was schizophrenic also. It was obviously inherited from, from his mother. They didn't know Ronnie Lang. If they'd known Ronnie Lang, they, they would have been, you know, I don't know schizophrenic, what it means even. I really don't. I think everybody is schizophrenic. <laughs> I don't know. So, 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 uh, yeah. So I think you know whatever you have to do. But let me just put in one one little devil's advocate piece of uh, information here, sort of on Yeshi Dandan's side. Yeah. And that is that, even though I completely agree with Nena about uh, dying when it's time to die. If somebody is comatose, if somebody is demented, if somebody is in some kind of state where they're not who they used to be and you're the family, the loved ones are really suffering because they're comparing who they used to be and who they are now and there's a big discrepancy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that person who is in that demented or comatose body is learning something, maybe at a very slow rate, but sure. th there is consciousness there. It's learning to be receptive. It's learning to be quiet. It's learning to receive. It's learning things that a lot of Westerners aren't very good at because we're so busy going down the tunnel like, like Robert yeah. was talking about before. So that maybe uh, di dying from... <laughs> well, we could... May he's saying maybe. All he said is maybe. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. That's usually done that point. We all agree that the preservation of life in whatever form is a, is really wonderful. Nobody's disagreeing with that, but life doesn't stop at death. I agree. So All it's I'm the saying is the quality of it that is key, then and then and in this case, it really seems to what nine times more intelligent yeah. after you're dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me let me look. Let me look at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let let's let me do All this. All I'm trying to say is one simple thing: is that. Yeah. When somebody is making these decisions, yeah. keep in mind there's two things going on. There's the human situation and the, and the standpoint of consciousness. Yeah. And keep those both in mind, not just the money and the body and the human and yeah, the sure, feelings, sure. that there's yeah, also no, consciousness. We, I, we all agree with you, done that. we do. Okay. But, he, but he's also very practical. Up to a point. Up, what? Up to a point. I'm, I, of course up to a he point. He said up to a point. <laughs> Having the flesh sleep, there's a quote here. There we There's go. a quote here. I, I, this is what I wanted to do tonight because this is our last night. We had our last supper, and this is our last night. <laughs> hey, noble one. This is back in, that's right. This is back in orientation to the emerging existence between. They have dealt with the mild deity, with the fierce deity. It's pretty intense, a lot of things they've done here, which we skipped. And uh, there's some particularly vivid things that you one has to read to really get, but I'm not going to do that, about the vivid colors. And the key, there's a very key point that's made, I should say, which is that you tell the departed person to totally go to the bright lights and totally open themselves to the loud noises and even the fierce thing, if it's coming to devour them, give themselves to be devoured because it's just a dream state like a dream state, it doesn't really hurt, you know? 
And uh, then that's the way they'll go in a more positive direction. Never run away and hide. Go to some dark place, think you can, they won't find you or something like that. And then it's a big, go to the bright light. That's the, it's the one thing you can boil down. But now, I just want to say, there's a tantra about, it says, upon awakening, your awareness became more clear and you immediately arose in a likeness of your former body. Actually, I don't like wearing hats. I'm not a hat person. Nina likes hats. Uh, having the fleshly form of the preceding and emerging lives, senses oh, you put it back on? Oh. <laughs> there you go, Nina. Thank you. <laughs> senses all complete, moving unobstructed with evolutionary magic powers, one sees similar species with pure clairvoyance. This is a description from the Guir, probably the Guir Garba Tantra. The, the, the authors are not sure, but we think it's the Guir Garba Tantra. And that's a description of the bardo being in this time. And then there are comments on it saying, here, preceding means that you arise as if in a flesh and blood body determined by the instincts of your preceding lives. If you are radiant and have traces of the auspicious bodily signs and marks of a mythic hero, it is because your imagination can transform your body. Thus, that perceived in the between is called a mental body. Right? Oh, and by the way, you, like you mentioned a wonderful thing which you should think about in your, in your moral dilemma, which I agree with you is a real dilemma, where you blind people out of body, although they are near-death people, because they report it in, you, you mentioned, sometimes people who are blind, they can see in their out-of-body state. And this has been proven and demonstrated by them going, what, went up to room 523, and, and, uh, and was clairvoyant as well, like a bardo being, and able to find the, the gallbladder problem of the patient that the dumb doctors were running around thinking had some other issue. So, so your, your cousin might be very relieved to get out of this trapped body that he is, and your assumption that he would be begging you, put me back in far Rockaway with my meds and my thing in my, in my schizophrenic state, he might not actually be asking for that. Anyway, at that time, if you are to be born as a god, you will have visions of the heavens. If you are to be born as a titan, a human, an animal, a praetan, or a hell being, you will have visions of whichever realm you will be born in. Preceding here means, or your, you know, preceding here means that for up to four and a half days, you experience yourself as having a fleshly body of your previous life with its habitual instinct. Emerging means that you begin to have visions of the place where you're heading for rebirth. And so they're commenting word for word on this quote. Therefore, do not follow after every vision that happens. Don't be attached to it. Don't adhere to it. Don't fall in love with Miss Piggy. If you are stubborn and attached to all of them, you will roam in suffering through the six realms. Up until yesterday, the visions of the reality between dawn for you but you did not recognize them. You didn't go to the heart beam, light beam of either the mild or the fierce deity. You will roam, so, uh, so you've had to wander here now. So now if without wavering you can develop recognition, the spiritual teacher's orientation can open your awareness of the clear light, the naked, pure, vibrant void. Enter into it, relax into the experience of non-holding and non-doing. Without having to enter a womb, you will be liberated. If you do not recognize the light, then meditate that your spiritual teacher or archetype deity is present on the crown of your head and devote yourself totally with a strong force of faith. It is so important. Do it without wavering again and again. Then again, he come, he, they comment and they say, hey, noble one, listen without your mind wandering. Senses all complete, moving unobstructed means that even if in life you are blind, deaf, crippled, and so on, now in the between, your eyes clearly discern forms. Your ears hear sounds. You don't need your hearing aids, Bob. And so forth. Your senses become flawlessly clear and complete. So senses are all complete. Recognize this as a sign that you have died and are wandering in the between. Remember your personal instruction. Hey, noble one, what is unobstructed, again back to this quote, unobstructed is your mental body. Your awareness is free from embodiment and you lack a solid body. So now you can move hither and thither everywhere, through walls, houses, land, rocks, and earth, even through Meru, that's the planetary axis, except through a mother's womb and the Vajra throne at Bodhgaya. Those are the only two places you can't go through. This is a sign that you are wandering in the existence between, 
to remember the instructions of your spiritual teacher. Pray to the Lord of great compassion. Hey, noble one, with evolutionary magic powers, that's a quote, means that you, who have no special abilities or meditational magic powers, whatever, now have magic powers arising as the result of your evolution. In a split second, you can circle this four-continent planet with its axial mountain. You now have the power just to think about any place you wish, and you will arrive there in that very instant. You can reach anywhere in return, just as a normal man stretches out and pulls back his arms. But these various magic powers are not so miraculous. If you don't specially need them, ignore them. You should not worry about whether or not you can manifest this or that, which you may think of. The fact is you have the ability to manifest anything without any obstruction. You should recognize this as a sign of the existence between. You should pray to your spiritual teacher. Then, hey, noble one, what sees similar species with pure clairvoyance means that beings of the same species in the between can see each other. Thus, if some beings are of the same species, all going to be reborn as gods, they will see each other. Likewise, other beings of the same species to be reborn in whichever of the six realms will see each other. So you should not be attached to such encounters. Meditate on the Lord of great compassion. With pure clairvoyance refers also to the vision of those whose pure clairvoyance has been developed by the practice of contemplation, as well as to the vision of those whose divine power of merit has developed it. But such yogis or deities cannot always see between beings. They see them only when they will to see them, not when they do not, or when their contemplation is distracted. Hey, noble one, as you have such a ghostly body, you encounter relatives and familiar places as if in a dream. When you meet these relatives, though you communicate with them, they do not answer. When you see your relatives and dear ones crying, you will think, now I have died, what can I do? You feel a searing pain like a fish flopping in hot sand. Mm -hmm. So that's why they don't like the people to go be very demonstrative, the grieving people, after a death and freak out the, the ghostly soul being of the, of the between state. But however greatly you suffer, tormenting yourself at this time does not help. If you have a spiritual teacher, pray to your spiritual teacher or else pray to the compassionate archetype deity. Don't be attached to your loved ones. It is useless. Pray to the compassionate ones and do not suffer or be terrified. Hey, noble one, driven by the swift wind of evolution, your mind is helpless and unstable, riding the horse of breath like a feather blown on the wind, spinning and fluttering. You tell the mourners, don't cry, here I am. They take no notice, and you realize you have died, and you feel great anguish. Now do not indulge in your pain. There is a constant twilight, gray as the pre-dawn autumn sky, neither day or night. That kind of between can last for one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven weeks, up to 49 days, though, et cetera, and it goes on like that. So don't be scared. Even if you feel you're being chased by people, having nightmares, they can't hurt you. And don't be mad if, you're, if your friends, if the priests are not doing a good job in the funeral and they're thinking about having a beer later. <laughs> don't be upset. Don't be upset if your relatives, some of them, are not really warning you. <laughs> because you're clairvoyant and read their minds. Yeah. It goes on and on like that. And I, I just thought that was useful to see that what's, you know, just to imagine that what's going to happen to the person who you pull the plug on or they pull the plug or whatever it is, it's not the end of the story, is the key point. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, and it could be a relief. We just don't know. So it is a dilemma because we don't know. And, and we know the, the Bishidun then laid down the guideline, and that's good. That's our intention. But in some cases, why put someone through such dreadful stuff, you know, when they could move on in another dimension very nicely, you know? Yes, Sarit. Um, assuming that you would be... Hmm? Assuming that one would be let somebody go and not have to worry about it, and still sort of being positive, that you also... Finally. Sure. Absolutely. Assuage whatever upset or anxiety, perhaps, or any unfinished business that you Definitely. think they might have left. Definitely. Do you yeah. need to actually either listen to a reading that some of the people read or just meditate? Certainly. On them? There's a book that is published, a very dreadful book, by Oxford Press called The Life of Rallo Zawa. Rallo Zawa was a famous yogi, a Tibetan yogi, who studied a lot in Nepal and Tibet at the time of Marpa and Milarepa in the 11th century. 
And he is dealing with the time in Tibet when there are a lot of bad gurus running around Tibet. The Tibet is kind of, Buddhism is kind of rekindling after a century or so of neglect. And uh, there's a lot of sort of, you know, what one Argentine guy once was in Argentine. And Rasa, he, Rasa, Rasa. What? Rasa, Rasa. Ralo Dawa, his name is. No, 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 I'm just I'm trying to tell a story. I was visiting in Argentina, and I asked one guy if they hadn't had any spiritual teachers there or something. He said, yes, he said, we've had muchos swamis pistoleros. <laughs> he said, swamis pistoleros, you know, like banded swamis, he told me. And uh, this guy, and you know, a lot of sort of really you know, unethical and nasty guru types, you know, and they were, and they were very open to it, the Tibetans at that time. So, so Rano Dawa, actually he, and they all, the guy who translated it, you know, some scholar, were all hor horrified by it, and because Rano Dawa often wastes these people. They have sort of magic contents, and he kills lots of them. But he always follows them in the between, and then he, he jacks them up into a positive place in the between. And, and it's kind of a rule, actually, the exceptional bodhisattva who does a fierce deed, which they do have in the, in the, in the whole tantric thing of India and Tibet, they, they are not allowed to do it unless they can follow the person afterwards. So now, an ordinary people like us, in your kind of situation, William, then, of course, if you had the access in Tibet to some lama who knew how to do poa, to some monks who could do a ritual, to yourself if you could do a ritual, you know, then if you heard they were going to pull the plug because they were going to do, they, they would call you and say, well, he's in this certain crisis and we're not going to resuscitate, then, or your daughter urges you to do that, you would go there yourself, take that lama, and try to do something. You know, someone else who would be a specialist at doing that. And that, that they do because in a way, you know, there's, a, there's the individual adept who actually can see the person in between. In the movie Ghost, it was Whoopi, remember? <laughs> Whoopi could see the ghost. And she helped him save the wife from the bad guy, right? Because like there was one psychic who could see the ghost. <laughs> I said, whoopee, that was her great deed. And, and, uh, but if you can't do that, then the society has specialists who try to deal with that. And there are people like that. And some of them are not, they don't have to be Buddhists or Tibetan lamas. There are other people who have this kind of ability. And, they, and one should try to get one of them to help. And then manage the thing. The key, another key thing I think that we never think about is because of, the, as I said, the consensual reality of our culture is at a funeral, the most important person is the disembodied spirit of the one who's died. Not the grieving people, and the, they are not the most important people. The, the one who's going through the big transition, who needs all the help, is the one who died. You know? But nobody ever thinks that. They just say, oh, poor, J oh, you're lost. So -so. It's like the guy is like too much meat or something, or it's like a number in a book. You know, but actually, he's the one who's freaking out. And the Tibetans are very against those cultures where people tear their hair and their clothes and shriek and freak. Because you know, he's saying, if, if this is correct, if these reports are correct, he's saying that causes a searing pain in the one who has departed. They see their relatives having a complete death. Like, has this been a disaster? Maybe it's been a disaster. I was feeling kind of cool. I was seeing my guide. I was remembering my instructions from Dale. I was like, Ram Das is there, the blessed grace, fierce grace. I was all happy. And then suddenly these people are freaking out. Maybe something terrible wrong has happened. <laughs> and gets all upset, which is really bad for that person. Then they, then they go run away in bad places. But wouldn't the person who's just died realize that that's just the attachments of all those relatives and that their, their, experience, so. their experience of the luminosity right after they died, yes, wouldn't that be a remember, lot stronger than... Remember, when you're in that subtle thing, it's like a dream. And you are a being who's hold, you're holding yourself together on pure concept and emotion. So you're incredibly malleable. You know, yeah, you're right. incredibly susceptible. You're very, very highly oversensitive okay. in a way. How's that? Right. That makes sense. <laughs> we talked to Randall. Okay, guys. It's not time to go. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Where's the hat? Well, you have to put on the hat if you're begging the hat. You you're going to be here hat. tomorrow morning, right? You're going to be here tomorrow morning? I am going to be okay. here tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Don't forget daylight savings. The plug. It says they don't put